Uh, we're very happy to have Sinan Iran uh, here to, uh, from Immunity. And uh, Sinan, um, he's worked there since 2003. He's a VP of research. And uh, before that, he's a senior research scientist with uh, Intercept. Uh, he's an expert at finding new vulnerabilities and developing state-of-the-art and exploitation techniques. His specialty lies in the analysis and exploitation of operating systems, service software, software infrastructure applications. Uh, recently, he's been focusing on hardware-based and alternative uh, attack, tech, attack techniques. Um, so today, uh, his presentation is titled uh, Information Operations, which I guess is yes. a nice, uh, nice play on the immunity name there. Um, and he's going to discuss some, uh, uh, some new attack techniques uh, to uh, attack secure networks, such as uh, client-side attacks, application backdoors. And uh, so, uh, very happy to have you here. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for having me. Um, well, infor informa I mean, uh, information operations, let me put up the slides. Uh, we actually first meant it to be information operations, but some, uh, some folks that we know from um, intelligence backgrounds thought it was a, a gross misuse of the term. So we kind of come up with this play of uh, naming it information operations. So uh, uh, as uh, the flattering <laughs> explanation put, put uh, I think probably put together by Dave, we, uh, I t try to take care of the research uh, immunity. We're, uh, we're a small boutique uh, uh, security firm that does uh, offensive technologies, uh, that build offensive technologies. Uh, our main product you might have heard is Canvas. It's a penetration testing uh, 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 framework. Uh, but we also try to develop other tools, standalone tools, hardware-based technologies, but mostly focusing on the offensive side of, uh, the offensive side of say, information security. <clears throat> so today uh, we'll be talking about uh, a real-life scenario, uh, which is, uh, I'll try to differentiate why is it different than a, a typical pen test that we conducted uh, with, a, with, a, with a corporation, uh, which, is a, you know, which we, uh, we will call it as a high-value target and leave it at that. And uh, it was a long-term uh, long operation. It was a long-term scanning, testing. And uh, it involved uh, building technologies specific to that customer attacking for attacking their network. Uh, while uh, we were conducting this assessment, uh, which again we called information operation, uh, just to differentiate between the, the, the typical pen test that's been conducted uh, these days, I mean, for a while, uh, so uh, we, we came into unique challenges about, about how to attack this network. And you know, it involved uh, using, there's a problem? OK, thank you. So there were some unique challenges uh, about this network. Uh, so we came up with uh, certain technologies uh, just to, just to you know, work, work these problems around. So uh, the one of the major differences between a typical pen test that, uh, and, and what, we, you know, what we conducted uh, towards, this, uh, towards, towards, this, uh, towards this company was, it was a long-scale operation. Uh, we could say on and off it was about three months. Yeah, we, we went on with our daily duties. It wasn't like a full-time all day, but we had to set up certain uh, exploitation vectors. Uh, we, we set up uh, custom backdoors and stuff, and we did a long-time uh, data collection, and we had a... Uh, internal uh, and, and a quite large scope of uh, targets that we can uh, we can uh, we can attack and identify. Uh, it was a to it was obviously a different type of contract. We we knew these uh, folks on an executive level, and uh, we they were on board pretty much most of the time. And uh, and the time wasn't that was no specific time for a start and end. That was just a goal. And we were to uh, we were to come up with the, the terms that says whether we achieve that goal or it was unachievable. So again, uh, the differences between what we like to call information operations and, and a pen test is that we did not have any time limits. And we, we were able to collect data over a large scale of time, uh, which, inform, you know, with, which this, uh, that data involved a lot of uh, information about who works uh, at what department, who does what. Some of them open source intelligence, looking at mailing lists and, and, and whatnot. Some of them came uh, uh, directly after exploitation. Uh, so we'll get into details of these. Uh, but first, we uh, we started uh, with a with a mindset that, that differentiated from uh, typical pen tests. We were not we decided on not to do uh, extensive scans. That you know we're not we weren't going to run MMAP scans. We weren't going to 
try to fingerprinting operating system. We weren't going to do all these typical things. It was a this was a this was a corporation with a security department and with uh, people on board that dedicate their full time on on you know network IDSs and all, all the typical uh, all the typical stuff. So this is a <laughs> this is a fun actually. <laughs> Funny uh, graph from Dave. Well, it tries to symbolize is that you have a security department, you have a security budget, and it's uh, it's the gray line that's going up and down, and the red one is the attacker. Uh, and then at some point, as you can see, the red line goes over the gray line, and that's the time well where, where you want to be at and where you break. And it's just uh, just another fun uh, intent slide. Uh, so I want so. Uh, our, uh, our model in mind was not to find out what's out there. We, had, uh, we knew that certain things have to exist. A web server, an MTA server, a mail server, a DNS server, some uh, border you know, routers and firewalls and VPN devices, whether it be applications or software, hardware or software based. And then of course the endpoints, which we had no idea what they are. So, you know, clients, uh, basically client operating systems. <clears throat> So um, we know that these things exist. Uh, they're, they're easily gatherable from open source intelligence. You do, uh, you do NS lookups and you, know, uh, you do uh, basic certain queries and, and learn about you know, where the, the MX records tells you the mail server and, and, all, these, uh, and all those simple things. So we, we identified about four or five different machines that were just, just doing basic uh, queries. And uh, we did not pick on the web server. So again, a typical uh, penetration testing involves around looking for known vulnerabilities. They scan networks, they look for our operating system, identify them, they look for ports, they look for applications, do some extensive application level fingerprinting, and they check these informations against, against hot fixes and patch levels and all that. But the recent, I would say, I don't know how recent, but probably the last three years or four years, there's more focus on the web applications. But yes, you're, if you're a financial uh, corporation, yeah, web applications matter. There should be pen tests towards these web applications. But you know, if you don't have a, uh, if you have a static dry content on your web server that does not do anything, I mean, let's say you're in the uh, aerospace industry. I mean, what your web page doesn't hold really anything interesting. And in this case, it, our our uh, uh, client had had his web server on, on a hosting company. So we weren't really interested in hacking into GoDaddy and whatnot, you know. So it's just dry HTML uh, content without any useful logic, and they run on Apache. So these are these are hard targets, and you know, if you want to directly attack the application itself, uh, these are well-known uh, players out there, and, and they, they've been audited, they've been looked into for for a long time. So we did not pick on the web server. We did not pick on the infrastructure. Yes, I mean, uh, you're hearing about great research uh, being uh, publicized about hardware. We, we do a lot of uh, reverse engineering and trying to you know, exploit the hardware devices as well uh, in, in, in the research labs. But uh, these are usually really costly uh, equipment. You, know, you can buy uh, Cisco routers over eBay and whatnot, but a real world uh, router you're targeting is way beyond, beyond your uh, budget. So these are costly lab setups. and. There's a lot of firmwares out there. There's a lot of iOS versions. There's a lot of PIX versions, even UID a bug. There's no guarantees you're going to write a, write a you know, uh, exploit that is reliable and that's not going to give you, give you away. So again, another goal in mind was we wanted to be really stealth. We wanted to do this right. There are a lot of things that are known but not really addressed is that um, you know, there's these things you read about uh, the targeted attacks coming from other countries and all those. So, so when it's, when it's other countries or rogue uh, players out there, these things are talked about. But the thing is, uh, uh, you know, these, these things exist. Zero days exist, and these, this is the reality. And there's targeted attacks out there. People, you know, focus on your infrastructure, find, find a weak link, and then use it to leverage their, their penetration. So we wanted to mimic that, basically. We don't want it to do a compliance scan on, on the network. We didn't want to say, you have your hot fixes there, you didn't have those, you have a SQL injection there and this. We just wanted to mimic a, you know, a real adversary out there. Again, we skipped the VPN and the firewall. We couldn't even ID what they were and uh, whether they're hardware based or software based, these are really costly and, and tough applications to attack. So typically, uh, you'll pick on the endpoint. You pick on the client size, your IEs, your Acrobat readers, your Outlooks and, and all these stuffs. But this is somewhat blind, um, and uh, you know you, you do some open source intelligence again from mailing lists, from uh, 
from corporate uh, information from LinkedIn and all those, you, you get, uh, let's say, 500 employees or something like that, and you just wanted to spam these guys' emails for, uh, for a client-side attack, whether a known client-side, where, the, where there's zero that you develop. But this is uh, really easier to detect by a smart opponent, and, and it's easy to burn a zero day. So you, you, have, a, uh, you, have, a, you have a good client-side attack, you invested time in it, you attack, and one of these failed because of, uh, because of an endpoint security uh, software or, or because just sheer bad luck, and then it's easy, to, it's easy to, for them to recover from that point on. And, and it leaves a lot of uh, traces behind. You email all these things, you, you know, once, uh, once they hit the exchange, you have, to, you have a lot of uh, fingerprints left over there. So this uh, funny graph, again, tries to s show you that when you're using client size to attacks, you're usually in that yellow area. So, uh, so we try to avoid that. We wanted to gather more information about our, uh, our network than we, we, we thought about maybe leveraging uh, further access with using uh, endpoint exploits, client-side exploits. We picked the mail server. So uh, why we picked the mail server? Because uh, it's, it is guaranteed that there is uh, valuable intelligence on the mail server. It's your mails. It's your uh, most important uh, software application that con you know, connects you to the outside. And especially for this client, uh, mail was more interesting than any other medium because, uh, you know, it's, it's your clients, it's your suppliers, it's, it's why, where, you buy, you know, where you get support, where you buy products, where, you know, people who sell your products. And it's one, one machine. It could be load balance, it could be, it could be all those, but it's, after all, it's one software. So uh, we picked on, on, the, on the mail server. We did not do any, any scans. We did not do any large uh, class scans to identify, as, a, as I say, the network of, the, of this client. We did not do even a port scan on the mail server itself. We know that port 25 is going to answer, answer us with, with, uh, with at least some SMTP uh, protocol replies. Maybe it will print uh, the application uh, banner or not. It could be disabled. So in this case, uh, they had the banner on, uh, the application banner on. But then again, we thought about this problem, and um, we, we put a product, we put a tool in, in Canvas that basically does a bunch of uh, bogus SMTP queries, retrieves responses, and we have a large uh, data, database of, uh, of, of MTAs that it cross-references the, the responses, the SMTP response, and try to identify uh, what MTA is run on the, on the other end. So uh, the MTA gateways are, are, are fundamental. I mean, they are there. You, you have to do something about malware. You have to do something about spam. So there's uh, an AV running on pretty much every large corporation and every high-value corporation's uh, uh, mail server. Whether we need a plugin to Exchange, whether we need a, you know, a, some, some AV vendor's gateway that basically receives the email, does some scans, and then forwards it to the Exchange or send mail or whatever else you're running. So we call this the, the soft direct approach, and uh, we Download the, download the software from the website, uh, put it apart. Um, it's much easier than trying to attack uh, operating systems at this point. You, don't, you, know, you, you know that they know about network, network filtering. You know that they know how to use their firewall. There is no point in for you to, uh, you know, going and investing time into the TCP IP stack of Windows Server at this point. They have a gateway. You know they run an AV. And AVs are traditionally known to be uh, quite badly written in, in many aspects. So um, we, we downloaded the software. We found out what uh, AV, you know, it's, it's running, what's, uh, what AV software it licensed. And, uh, you know, we knew from, from, uh, from past that there's a lot of issues in file format parsing in, in AV engines. And what the surprising part was that... Uh, the, the software was uh, restarting no matter what. It was handling pretty much every exception, and even things went really bad, it was automatically restarted by a watchdog. So, so that was a good start. We knew that at, at, from that point on, even if we have uh, failed exploitation attempts, we will have you know, as many chances that we get uh, attacking the software. So we model uh, our target as best as we can. Uh, we installed uh, server uh, operating systems from Windows 2000, uh, 2003, all, all the service pack levels and whatnot. And uh, we, we did this with VMware, of course, but it, at the very last uh, moment before we uh, run our attack, we, we did some tests on, on real iron for the reasons I'll explain later. 
So uh, again, uh, when you're doing these kind of uh, targeted attacks, uh, language detection, you, need, you might, the, the operating system language, uh, the locales might, might be an issue. But at, at this case, we knew uh, which, we, you know, which locale they were in, basically English. Um, so there is, uh, if you look back into the history of, of these, uh, of exploits and, and uh, you know, there has been uh, tremendously uh, written exploits out there like the SSH exploit of so some years. These were written in a way that they did not take into account what the, the Linux distribution was out there that they were targeting. They were written in so much effort and so much time was put into them, they were basically working on every version or any, every possible installation. Because uh, there was a lot of uh, amazing brute force logic put into these exploits. We did not want it to take that route because it takes a lot of time. You need to pretty much dedicate one person on writing these exploits and pretty much it's, it's a development effort that takes several months. So we wanted to instead extensively model our target in our lab. So we wanted to make sure we knew uh, what operating system, which service pack, you know, it's, whether it's an AMD 64, whether it's, it's, uh, it's an Intel 32-bit uh, machine. We did as, as, as best as uh, network uh, identification, uh, you, you know, using MMAP and all these tools and some build and other Canvas tools, uh, just try to build up the, the final uh, target machine as best as we can uh, to replicate our, our target. So another thing, interesting thing about the, this AV uh, gateway, AV spam gateway, was that the crashes, uh, the logs, the, when the watchdog started to crash uh, MTA process, it was really vague. There was no inf information out there. It was just say, it's suddenly terminated and then restarted by the watchdog, pretty much it. Nothing about, there's no back traces, there's nothing that, uh, you know, gives out that there was a failed exploitation attempt. So again, uh, the most interesting thing, and probably the, uh, the the most futile thing about AV is that, the, that we find out pretty much all the other AVs that we did research as well, that they were uh, breaking Microsoft, uh, Microsoft latest uh, technologies that they put into, into Microsoft operating systems to, for exploit resiliency. They were bro breaking DEP, the, 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 the non-execution for, uh, for writable uh, uh, memory areas. They were breaking uh, uh, safe SCH because they were loading all kind of uh, DLLs that were not compiled with, uh, they were compiled with Borland basically, because uh, AVs carry a lot of uh, excessive baggage from old times. They, 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 had, they wrote unpackers that they only compiled with Borland back in the time. They have third party, uh, third party decompression libraries that are, that are uh, licensed from third parties and these are compiled with 1995 with Borland's, you know, something and then these are directly, uh, directly uh, linked or loaded into the process. So they break safe SCH. And also another fun thing that we found out that Borland, when, it, when you compile their uh, partial part of their source or their whole source with the Borland compilers, it comes with, their, with uh, Borland's own uh, allocator. And that's a terrible mess. Uh, it even corrupts itself at times you know, without, uh, without giving you any, any source of idea what went wrong. And it was the easiest uh, heap allocator to exploit that we ever, we ever encountered. Microsoft put into uh, a lot of work into with the low fragmentation heap and, and all these things uh, into Vista and, and probably in 2008, but uh, these things were not were not in the in the in the MTA gateway in the AV process because they were using the Borland's allocator. We did not find any stack overflow. I'll get into details about the overflow itself, but uh, if we did find a stack overflow, that there was no GS as well since it was the stack cookie protection since it was compiled with Borland. We found a uh, heap overflow in, in an unpacking of a certain file format. And also, uh, again, during, uh, you know, after this assessment, we did a lot more research into AV. And uh, AV engines seems to be the, the champions of uh, typecast and overwrap, overwrap bugs. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, they, they usually limit uh, the size to shorts when they're doing uh, read operations and whatnot. But then uh, they have a terrible track of, uh, you know, uh, doing stuff like this that they add a bunch of uh, header and subsection sizes and then they typecast it into a short, obviously, you know, it's 64K and after, after all those additions, it might wrap to zero or something smaller and then they, they use the, the subsection sizes or the block header sizes and all those things later into the, uh, to, into the read IOs. Also, there's other, 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 uh, typecast related issues that I didn't put, put down here. But for example, they might read in a total size from again, uh, the, the, the file header somewhere. They can allocate that much and then they can read in using a subsection size. 
you know, the binary is, could, uh, does, could tell you some total size, and that is just 10, and the subsection size can be 200. So they, they, don't, they don't verify these things uh, really well. And uh, these, these are pretty well known, actually. Alex Wheeler has done a lot of research, and this vernacular that we find out also uh, later turned out to be also found by him, and it was, it was taken care of later on. So at this point, we had our report flow. It was uh, corrupting the, the, the Borla's indicator. Uh, we had the uh, easy, easy way of exploiting it. And the exploitation vector was pretty straightforward. It, it's just an email attachment. You can send it to a void user. It doesn't have to be a legit user. And um, the email is scanned no matter what, and then it's silently discarded. There's no traces left. Uh, okay, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the DEP was disabled by the product. And even if we had failed uh, exploitation attempts, it was restarted later on. And we did fail when we attacked a bunch of times, but eventually, uh, Remember I mentioned the real iron? We first developed this exploit on VMware, and we keep failing on the target side. We installed it on the real iron, and then we found that there was some disparities between VMware and the real iron, the real hardware. And we fixed it, we tried again, and we were in. So uh, most of the technology that is part of Canvas is, is basically a shellcode technology. And uh, after we wrote our exploits for this, uh, for this uh, MTA gateway, we first break in using uh, the Canvas technology. But then we wanted to uh, use this. Usually, a typical pen test might, might call it a day and then write a report and be done. But we, we, had, uh, we had, again, as I mentioned, uh, different mindsets. We did not have any strict uh, timeline. We did not have, uh, have any, any restrictions on what sort of data we can access. So at this point, we sit down and develop a quite uh, easy custom backdoor. Uh, since you're on the MTA gateway, uh, and sh since you're breaking into the AV, you get uh, you got every email basically. The AV process is handed out just a file, which is the which is the email itself. So we thought about okay, let's uh, log all these emails, and then later you know we collect them. So we had a typical custom backdoor that does two things. It was uh, download. It was taking uh, the the emails. But of course, we hooked uh, the AV process. We hooked in this uh, backdoor DLL into the AV process, which was getting a copy of the of the of the file that was being scanned. So we, uh, and Microsoft has this uh, wonderful DLL, the, the cabinet DLL, which stores files into a cap file, and then it rotates them automatically. So you don't, we didn't really have to have elaborate uh, file, uh, file compression and file uh, storage related uh, problems. We use what Microsoft gave us. It was a quick development. Again, we logged the emails into cap files and we scanned emails for a, uh, for, a uh, for a special trigger when we see that trigger, we were again sending out a MOSDEF shell, which uh, later we used to collect these emails. We did uh, quite a long time of email collection. Uh, again, I have to uh, say that the executive level guys were on board with us, and, uh, and you know, we have certain limitations of what can we do with these emails and what parts we can look into, but you, looking at the headers and the attachments were pretty much enough to analyze and to find out more about this network, more, get more about this corporation, who was sending emails to who, what type of attachments were coming in and out. And um, we, we were mapping the sole trust relationship uh, pretty quickly in, in about, about this uh, cross-networks uh, cross, uh, that were going back and forth and, and exchanging executables at some point. So uh, we wanted to breach further. We're on the DMZ right now. We we are on the on the MTA itself. So again, we just uh, we just exploited trust at that point. Um, we we just injected uh, our what we now call pink. Back then, it was just a prototype, another custom uh, backdoor that we developed, which I'll, I'll talk later on. Uh, we injected pink into just an attachment. Basically, there was a bunch of attachments going back and forth. And uh, we did not use any client size. We thought we might have uh, some use for them after we figure out the internal network, but it was much easier than that. So uh, we broke into from the DMZ into the into the endpoint into the net uh, into the client network, and uh, from there, you know, I'm not going to go into details, but from there we leveraged for further into the uh, primary domain controller using a well-known uh, DNS RPC exploit, MS RPC exploit. We obtain a domain hash, and uh, we use the domain hash into installing uh, MOSTEF nodes. Again, the, the, the canvas technology uh, that, that talks over HTTP to the outside, and we install these into a bunch of interesting desktops that we identified, again, reading email, looking at the emails. 
So we knew which guys were the interesting guys. We knew which guys hold the key to the kingdom. So we, using a domain hash, we targeted just these uh, individuals strictly. So one machine that we were really interested in that, that uh, they, were, they were emailing out a bunch of attachments from, that, uh, from the desktop uh, machine. So we, we, broke into, we broke into that machine using a domain hash. And uh, we see that there was traces of files that were interested. Uh, that was, you know, that was the, the actual target itself that we had in mind, but they were not there. So uh, there is this file called setup API log, which uh, keeps track of all the USB hardware that's been plugged into your device. And we see a lot of extensive logs of in the setup API log that indicated that there was a heavy usage of USB drive, USB mass storage drives. And uh, at that point, we assumed that the files that were that were listed in the recent accessed files folder uh, that they were they were in the USB drive, so so the assumption was that there's a USB drive storage drive that is going between some other network, some uh, segmented network that has these files. Again, from the email collection on the MTA server, we found out that there's a third-party vendor that is in touch with this uh, with this client, and then they're exchanging information about the product they they purchased from this third party. So um, we remember that there's this tool uh, written by a bright French guy, uh, really bad with the name right now. Uh, it's called USB Dumper. Basically, it just uh, sits there and then waits for an insertion of, of a USB drive and uh, copies the files and then emails them out. We didn't want to do that that way. We took USB Dumper, we modified it into an in-memory in injection, again, a DLL trick that we, that we already use on the MTA. We had some uh, file tracking to it just to make sure that we don't keep the, you know, uh, copying over the same file over and over again. We had some free, space, uh, free disk space tracking to, to the software as well. And again, time passed. Uh, finally, uh, we, we, we were able to uh, reach to some data that was, that was supposed to be segmented, that was supposed to be an air gap between these two networks. But uh, because of this tainted USB drive going back and forth in these two networks, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we were able to access to some high value, uh, high value content for, for this site, and we call it a day. That was, that was pretty much the end, end of this uh, operation that we, we, we now name information operation. So um, some conclusions. Um, again, these are crucial, uh, crucial software. You need to run these uh, spam and, and malware, I mean, AV gateways and antivirus software and all that. But um, they're, they're terribly written. That's the reality out there. There's, um, there's a bunch of guys from Enruns, uh, a, a company from Germany. They're going, they gave some presentations about their findings. I guess uh, probably over 40, 50 bugs that they found in various AV vendors in one year, just in one year. And um, uh, this, this whole problem uh, about writing parsers, more and more parsers to protect uh, applications, to protect protocols, is uh, just turning out to be a terrible idea. You're, you're, you, instead of securing it on the, on the protocol itself, in the protocol's in actual application itself, you keep writing more parsers on top of these protocols. So AV is, is I believe, one of those, uh, one of those things. You, 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 there is a lot more, uh, there's a lot more parsers than in, in, put into AV than any other software you can imagine. There's different type of uh, compression algorithms that they deal with. They deal with all type of executable formats. They, they, uh, they, they scan for uh, ELF binaries, MAC binaries, MAC OS 9 binaries on a Windows op operating system. For what reason? You know, it's, it's another attack surface that is really wide. Um, to, to be honest, they are they are they are a major security risk instead of uh, being a being a, you know being an instrument of protecting against malware. And uh, again, uh, some other conclusion that we come is that tainted USB drives, uh, which we call tainted because it goes between two networks that were supposed to be isolated by an air gap, could could be a could be a big issue. I heard from some uh, some folks that worked into uh, high security networks that. They color code their USB drive, so that could, that sounded like uh, like a uh, like a solution to this uh, sec potential security breach. So there's a color coded USB drive that can be worked only on one network. There's another color colored uh, USB drive that can that's only allowed to be plugged into one network. Of course, human will still do uh, mistakes, but at least that could be a, that could be an interesting uh, way out. 
Also, we learned from this that uh, relation mapping between people are crucial, of course, for, for successful uh, breaches. But also, uh, relation mapping uh, between what files goes between which networks, which users send which files to each other, all, and you know, all these other uh, details about email content uh, that need, needs, uh, needs to be put into these attack frameworks, into these uh, attack toolkits that we have to now have this complex understanding of, uh, of these trust relations, not just who emails who, but who emails what to who. So during this assessment, why I, why I talked uh, about this assessment is that during this assessment, we, we developed a bunch of technologies and, uh, that, come, uh, that, that we developed into, into, into further, uh, further, further uh, you know, excess elevation and, and you know, penetration tools. Uh, and then we, 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 uh, we put it into Canvas. So, uh, so one of these technologies we named Pink uh, is, is uh, is a post uh, client side exploitation tool. So there is a, there's this problem about, uh, let's say you, uh, you, you, you break into 10 client sites. Okay, easily manageable. You break into 100, you break into millions. So how do you, how do you control these networks and uh, how do you handle these, uh, these uh, penetrations? So uh, a lot will call these, uh, Call these drones, and you know they 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 are they are now uh, part of botnets, and they're well-known technologies that are used to control, and command and control these botnet networks. Uh, I think uh, Dave Dittrich and and uh, Bruce Deng gave a talk about it, about this uh, yesterday. I mean, if you attend it, you know more about these uh, than I do now. So uh, they're usually uh, control vectors. Uh, the co control sent control and command technologies are based on IRC. Uh, which is easy to tear down, which is easy to take take over. You know, you can you can uh, you can just make a call to the ISP and the network is down, or you can just go ahead and and take it over. HTTP to a single server is another problem. Just once the, the drone or the backdoor is detected, it's uh, reverse engineered, the IP is extracted, and then you can again take over this HTTP server that the drone network talks to. There is the sole fax flux of DNS servers and all that. Again, these are could be easily blocked. And the other one, uh, which, uh, which seems to be gaining traction, is the P2P uh, storm networks and, and, and all that stuff. They are really reliable. Uh, they seem to work pretty well. But then again, they're not covert because uh, you, know, the, 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 you know the TCP traffic of these P2P uh, protocols. And they don't usually go through uh, strict proxies and firewalls. So our solution to uh, controlling our own you know, command and control, creating our own command and control technology, we, we had uh, three, three goals. It has to be scalable. We should be able to categorize these drones into, into groups. It should be co uh, co uh, covert and it should be portable. So we came with uh, Pink and uh, this is what the, simply the Pink technology looks like. So once you break into the cloud of targets and uh, deploy your, 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 your Pink executable into them, uh, the way of these, tar this, these drones talking back to the, to the command and control server or, or the master itself is through, through blogs. So they go to, they go to uh, Google's blogs and then they search a special keyword that is embedded within the back door. And then uh, they, they look at all the outputs and they scan the output for a certain uh, pattern. When they found a, a pattern which we call dead drop, they, uh, they verified the contents of the pattern using uh, RSA key signing and then uh, verification. And based on what's in, inside this blob, inside this dead drop blob, they do certain, uh, certain, certain uh, things like talking back to a listening post, uploading files, downloading more files, executing comments. So currently, uh, in the pink uh, technology, uh, we use blog searching as the first uh, way of finding the master, the command and controls uh, network's master. Uh, c the reason why is are simple because th the blogs are indexed instantaneously. You just put up a blog post; it's right there. Um, it's easy to find, you know, uh, all these blog uh, sites. We we currently use uh, the most popular one, the Blogger.com. Uh, there's a lot of things to hide into. It's HTML basically. You paste your blob into it. You c you put the HTML comments into it, so it's not really visible when you look at the site. And, uh, and you, there's our assess feeds, which, which are also come really handy for, an, for, a technical, for a development point of view. And the next thing we do is that 
uh, we found out that WebSense is a really uh, commonly used technology and they tend to sometimes block, uh, block access to, to, to blog sites. So there's a fallback network. We fall back to Google's uh, main, main search site. So if we don't get anything, uh, any response from the blogger site, we fall to Google and then we, we search again for a certain pattern that is embedded into the, into the pink uh, the DLL <coughs> itself. And uh, we, we, we browse the, the, the results for a special dead drop for a special uh, blob. That's uh, pretty much how it looks like. Uh, there's a cover text. It could be anything you want to put there, you know, uh, news and, and whatnot. There's a trigger that, uh, that the pink DLL searches. And when the, the trigger is fined, uh, there's, a, there's a base uh, 64 encoder stream. And this uh, base 64 encoder stream is encrypted by an RSA, uh, is signed by an RSA uh, key. So Pink uh, verifies, this, uh, ver verifies the signature. And if, it's, if, it's, uh, if somebody's trying to take over your drone network, uh, we, we thought of that might be, the, that might be a time-based key might be the way out of, 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 of that. So uh, we sign and encrypt. RC4 encryption, we use that, but uh, it's, it's pointless, I guess, because the, the key's in, inside the DLL itself. But the, the signature uh, can, can prevent a lot you know, from takeovers, from uh, replay attacks, and whatnot. Uh, also, you know, we use uh, random words uh, for our search uh, queries. We use, uh, we use the, the daily news, uh, you know, what's going on uh, in, the, in the time of the exploitation attempt. And we create blog uh, entries re regarding these uh, common news. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll get into some, some technologi technological details about, about the, the backdoor itself. So uh, we, we, we had the problem of um, not really knowing, uh, you know, oh, there's, there's a wide uh, uh, stream of operating systems out there. You know, it could be an XP box, even on the Microsoft uh, uh, scale of things. You might have uh, admin privileges. You might not. Uh, you might not have that. You might have. Um, you might have a different setup. So we thought of uh, using a shell extension as, as a way of uh, being persistent on this on this client box. Uh, the sh Y shell extension doesn't require admin privileges. You just add it to the current user's registry key. It's personal across across re reboots. It just requires uh, a, a, an explorer uh, action like a click or a drag and drop or right click and copy paste. All these things uh, activates uh, all the register shell extensions. Um, uh, we, we use some simple technology that takes uh, itself, the, the, the DLL itself, out of the, the PB loaded modules list, which means that when you go into, let's say, uh, process explorer from sys internals, you don't see the DLL in, inside the process. It's partially invisible in user mode, but of course it's in the registry. So uh, we, we, we didn't go into details about writing a rootkit to hide the registry and stuff, because it's, it's a never ending game, because rootkits can be detected and what, what not. So we, at this point, we said, OK, the registry traces, we'll leave it at there. We picked up some uh, funny name uh, that goes with the, with the shell extension that sound, sounded quite legit. Um, also, we picked a shell extension uh, for, the, for the way of keeping our vector persistent because we don't know any AV product that the ones that we looked into, they don't, they don't really check for this. They check for the startup folder, they check for the run keys, they check for creating a service, they check for you know, all, all sort of, uh, all sort of uh, bad files that are being executed and, and whatnot. Or they check for the boot order uh, for rootkits and, 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 and other vector technologies, but they don't look for shell extensions, at, at least at the moment. And again, as I said, uh, when you, once you uh, install this shell extension to the registry, after a reboot or a logon, all it takes is just a click or a drag and drop or a copy paste operation for it to get activated. Personal firewalls might trigger on Explorer EXE doing an outbound connection because it has to go to the, the, to the blogger site to do the search and then you know, look for the dead drop. Um, doesn't seem to be a problem on the default firewall with it, that comes with XP. But there's a lot of uh, personal firewalls out there on the market. Uh, so we did not have a, you know, had a solution for, for all of them. But you know, it, it's easily doable uh, in the sense that um, you, know, you can inject it into another process. You can inject it into an Internet Explorer and whatnot. There are, there are ways that you can do the same type of trick with the Internet Explorer. You can use uh, browser helper objects. But a lot of AV products uh, and, and, and personal firewalls uh, and, and you know malware-related products check for uh, browser helper objects. So we stick to the shell extension, 
And uh, we know some personal firewalls might say Explore EXE wants to do uh, outbound connection. There's three components uh, to the Pink technology. There's uh, Pink.dll, and uh, there's the Pink installer, which the DLL is embedded within. And then there's the blog content generator, which basically RSA signs uh, your, your commands and then uh, put some wrap some trigger text around it for you to just paste on a, on a blog site. Um, so we thought of um, ways uh, for, for, for categorizing our, subsetting our uh, drone networks into, into, into certain groups. It could be about corporate, corporation, it could be a certain domain would be a certain, you know, anybody coming from immunityinc.com would be on a certain uh, group, uh, or any, for a country could be another subset. So we, uh, we, we wrote some simple web application that, that, that combined, uh, combined the, the pink inst the installer's, uh, installer's backend with GOIP. So basically this is what it looks like. You send out a client-side exploit, let's say a, a PDF uh, Acrobat reader exploit, and uh, the exploit has a simple uh, download and execute shellcode in it, which, which is a common uh, trade in client-side exploits. It goes to a web server to download uh, the pink installer executable. The pink is, when, the, when it asks for the pink installer executable uh, from, the, from this web application, the web application talks with the GUIP backend and then uh, sends out a specific uh, pink installer based on based on based on the IP address that that, that the client is coming from. So each pink installer uh, searches for a different pattern, which is answered by a different blog post. So the goal was, you know, to be able to uh, divide uh, our our drone networks into countries and companies and domains, and based on time of exploit, it could be any parameter parameter you like. So we wanted to do, to, to, to do things like the following, uh, all hosts from immunityinc.com domain, uh, go to this IP and you know, just give us a shell uh, over, over a canvas, most of technology. Uh, again, some uh, little more details about the ping technologies that uh, there's a timer. Uh, you know, it does these uh, uh, master command and control master searches uh, on blogs on, on, a, on a configurable time. Uh, the timer expires. Uh, the pink DLL, the, the pink executable, looks for uh, for some user mode action. If there's a keyboard activity, there's a mouse activity. It does go to the internet. So we don't want to do outbound connections at 5 a.m. or 3 a.m. Uh, out of a, out of a corporation. So we wanted to always check there's a there's a logged on and active user. If there's no user activity, we s we start sleeping on shorter time uh, shorter time intervals. And when there's user activity, we do, we do our uh, blog and Google search depending on which one is uh, logged. So these are some of the, the, the pink uh, commands that we currently support. Uh, we do callbacks to Canvas uh, over HTTP and HTTPS stream. So you have a pro you're behind a proxy. We, we do speak HTTP uh, with, you know, uh, with, with our drones. If you're in a more open environment, uh, it can do just a TCP connect back uh, to any listening post out there. It can download uh, an executable from a URL and execute it. It can download a DLL from, an, from a URL and, and load library it. It can execute the given command. Uh, it can upload a file into a web server and an, and, and an FTP server. It can do key logging. It could update itself. And then we're thinking about using a Microsoft VB scripting engine in order to write more complex commands. So um, to conclude, uh, what we did with Pink is uh, it's in better state. It, it should be uh, shipped out in the uh, to the to the ma to the old to the uh, mainstream Canvas users in in the next build. I believe in 3.0. Um, so, so what we're trying to achieve here is that we wanted to uh, look further into this whole offensive technologies and whole drone networks and, and see you know, how far we can take it. So it is going to be harder to detect these things, these technologies. Uh, it's going to be hard to monitor these things by automated solutions. Uh, a lot more, uh, you'll see a lot more search engine uses uh, for, for command and control networks. And, uh, it, and, and the best part about it that they don't require any uh, expensive infrastructure to, to manage your drones. You basically put up a post on some blog, and actually you might even take it to another extreme. You can have your commands uh, that you put up on a blog post returned to you as a blog comment. So you would have basically no infrastructure needed to control uh, your, your drones. So uh, as, as overall conclusions, um, information operations, uh, proven itself uh, in a different way than, than what Pentest does. 
the MTA was compromised. Uh, the endpoint was later on compromised using the trust. The air gap was, was breached by just uh, using a readily available tool on the internet. And uh, from this, we, we, can, we, have, we come up with, uh, with, the, with, with, a, with a potential solution for the, for the client side exploitation and command and control. Uh, the scalability and, and you know the, the covertness of this whole operation. Uh, so there's a, there's a different reality out there that there are more and more targeted attacks. Uh, there's there yeah the, the the trend was sending out millions of emails with uh, you know well known client sites even at point zero days, but now uh, attackers are focusing on more zero day per target uh, alike attacks and, and you're, we're going to see more and more of these and, uh, and the technologies that are used to further leverage uh, your access uh, is, is also going to be uh, changing in over time. So, so why I'm saying this is that um, there's not going to be a, a solution that will detect uh, and automate this uh, problem. So there, you're not ever going to have the 3,000 you know, $300,000 pizza box sitting on a network that is going to tell you that there is a target attack, there's a zero-day attack, there is this covert command line control drone that is coming out from your network. It's all about the, 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 the human at this point. It's all, about, it's all about training a team. It's all about, you know, uh, hiring and training the right people, you know, investing on more hum in human capital. That is, uh, that is going to be the only way out uh, in, 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 in the next coming phase of, uh, phase of things. And um, being on the offense, attacking your own applications, attacking your own network is going to be uh, key for survival. So uh, I met one CSO. Uh, I had the I was I was amazed uh, with her with her insight about this. That at that point uh, she was working for a large uh, financial corporation, and she had uh, amazing amazing reverse engineers, exploit writers on on board uh, hired during her her tenure over there. So this is the type of proactive, uh, proactive stance that a lot more big corporations, high value, uh, you know, potentially high value content pro pro providers uh, have to have to take uh, into action, into mind. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have a demo, but I think I'm just running a bit late. Yeah, I think we're. Yeah, 50. I think we're just out of time. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it.